Hi, everyone. Welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Today, we're going to look at a history of aerial refueling. I remember growing up in the 1950s and hearing from various Air Force sources that, oh, about once an hour, somewhere in the world, there was an airplane being refueled in midair. And I thought that was really pretty cool. But by comparison, today, at any given time, at any moment, there is an airplane being aerial refueled somewhere in the world. And this is now the mainstay of long range Air Force and military operations. But let's go back to the very beginning. The first operational military uh, aerial refueling occurred on January 1st of 1929 when a Douglas C-1 transport uh, took off from Van Nuys, California and uh, commenced to make 43 aerial refuelings of the uh, Atlantic C-2 nicknamed the question mark. The name was because no one knew when it was going to land. The uh, <clears throat> mission was to set a, an endurance record and uh, the Atlantic C-2 in actuality was a Fokker uh, 7 trimotor, but uh, being in military service, they wanted to give it an American name. These airplanes flew for six days. They covered 11,000 miles between Los Angeles and San Diego, and they made 43 refueling and resupply flights uh, during that week. Uh, it was an amazing effort and uh, really proved the validity of aerial refueling for extending the range of uh, air, long range Air Force aircraft. By World War II, the uh, long range bomber uh, was defined as uh, the Boeing B 17, of course, the consolidated B 24. But let's take a look at the performance of these airplanes. Uh, these were, uh, did not have aerial refueling capability, and the combat range with full payload was 2,000 miles. By the end of the war in the Pacific, the Boeing B 29 was extending that range. Uh, with a 5,600 mile ferry range and a 3,250 mile combat range. In the early years of the Cold War, the Convair B-36 uh, added a new dimension to long range operations. Again, this airplane was not uh, equipped for aerial refueling, but it had a 10,000 mile ferry range and a 4,000 mile combat range. Early in its flight test program, a Convair pilot flew the airplane non stop for 33 continuous hours, proving the endurance capability of the aircraft. In the jet age, the Boeing B-47 changed the game. 35 degree sweep back, potted engines, uh, new materials, new construction methods, and the jet age had uh, come into uh, usage in the military. Uh, this is also the airplane that literally set the stage for just about every jet airliner flying today. It was the great grandfather of the uh, 707, all the Boeing uh, family of aircraft, and it really uh, set the precedent for just about every transport aircraft airborne today. However, the early jets, the in this case the General Electric J-47s, uh, burned a lot of fuel, and so with a 4,600-mile ferry range unrefueled and a 2,000-mile combat range, uh, the B-47 was uh, really the first uh, test bed for aerial refueling, extending the uh, now nuclear capability of the United States Air Force. The airplane that changed the uh, aerial refueling game was the Boeing B-29. Of the uh, 4,000 B-29s built, 200 plus were converted to a hose and reel, and then eventually a flying boom tanker configuration. The original boom was uh, mounted, as you see here, under a kind of a crane a device uh, extending well after the tail. Uh, the boom operator sat in what would be the equivalent of the tail gunner position. You can see him seated here with the uh, controls for flying the boom. And these early boomers were nicknamed uh, Clancy for a popular song of that era, Clancy Lower the Boom. Here we see the boomer's view of a uh, Boeing B-50 uh, pulling into position for aerial refueling. Uh, it was complicated, it was complex. The uh, fuel flow uh, rates were uh, quite low. It was uh, quite an operation, but it did change the game in terms of extending the range of these long range aircraft. The first fighter uh, to feature a uh, built in refueling system was the Republic F 84 Thunder Jet. And uh, you see here on the leading edge of the wing the receptacle with the little uh, trap doors that open up and allow the uh, receptacle to uh, mate in directly into the fuel tank of the airplane. The Boeing uh, KB-50 came next. This was a development of the B-29. Uh, 
with uh, larger, more powerful uh, Pratt & Whitney R4360 engines and a taller tail uh, to deal with the extra power and torque. And the KB50s uh, were converted uh, into uh, a triple hose and drogue system aerial tankers. 136 of the 370 built uh, were converted into this configuration. And they served uh, from 1954 into the early years of the Vietnam War, uh, supplementing KC-135s at the beginning of that conflict. The B-50 was developed into a transport aircraft, the C-97. Here you see the uh, double-deck cargo configuration and then the aerial uh, refueling boom was added to the tail. And this became the KC-97K, referring to the prefix for uh, aerial tanker. The KC-97, 811 were built and this is the airplane that introduced uh, cargo tanker combinations for uh, long range deployments in the Air Force. We see it here refueling a Boeing B-47. And uh, as good as this was back in the day, uh, it, was, it was relatively primitive. You had a propeller driven aircraft uh, refueling a jet. Uh, Maybe hard to see in this photo, but the KC-97 is going downhill in what they call the toboggan maneuver. And the uh, B-47 has a notch of flaps and is hanging on just below, uh, just above uh, stall speed actually. Here we see the B-47 pulling into position. And here it is connected to the uh, refueling receptacle. You see there on the nose, the uh, door that flips open. And uh, here it is on the boom receiving fuel. Now this is interesting. We're gonna see a, a number of relationships between the tankers and commercial airliners uh, throughout uh, the different eras. So the C-97 Strato Freighter, which was the KC-97 minus the refueling system, was developed into the Model 377 Boeing Stratocruiser, a very luxurious uh, long-range airliner used uh, by many of the world's great airlines in the uh, late 40s and early 50s. Then we enter the jet age, Boeing's revolutionary 367-80. And you notice the 377 was the Stratocruiser. The 367 was a decoy model number so that the industry wouldn't uh, get uh, drift of the fact that they were developing a jet transport. This first flew in July of 1954, revolutionized the industry, and was developed into the KC-135A Strato tanker. This airplane first flew in 1956 and entered service with the Air Force a year later. KC-135 uh, was a game changer in that uh, the boomer was in a pod uh, lying prone in the back of the airplane and uh, now you had jet speeds that could match the uh, receiver aircraft and uh, uh, this started a long career. Many KC-135s are still flying today. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Uh, here's the receiver aircraft view pulling up under a KC-135A. Uh, the A model had the original J-57 turbojets that you see here. And uh, you get an, an interesting perspective. You can see the boomer window uh, just between the two national insignia there at the bottom of the airplane. Um, and this is the view looking down from the boomer position. Again, he's lying on his stomach uh, on a uh, pad with the controls uh, in both hands and he's flying the boom to the receptacle on the receiver aircraft. Here we see a Republic F-105F uh, on the receiving end of the KC-135. Now again, we go to the uh, transport cargo version of the tanker. Uh, and this is the C-135A uh, minus the refueling system. Uh, but Boeing had an interesting model number, the 717, which uh, is a current aircraft today, uh, renamed from the MD-95 uh, McDonnell Douglas aircraft after Boeing merged with uh, McDonnell Douglas in 1997. So this is a bit confusing for some of the airliner guys, but what you're seeing here is the original Boeing 717. This airplane was developed into the 707 Jet Strato Liner, a name that never really uh, stuck. But the 707 was the world's first commercial uh, long range multi-engine jet of the uh, uh, late 1950s. It went into service in October of 1958 with Pan Am. And this became the, the backbone of the airline jet fleets uh, well into the 1970s. Uh, the uh, development of the original 707 included the fan jet engines. Here we see the American Airlines Astrojet in this John Proctor photo. And uh, What's interesting, again, we talk about the interrelationship between the airliners and the uh, military uh, tankers. Uh, when the 707 Astrojets were retired in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, the Air Force uh, took these engines and fitted them to the 
original KC-135s. This became the E model, and these engines are now a military designation TF-33s, uh, much more efficient, more power, quieter, uh, much uh, less fuel burn. Uh, they were equipped with thrust reverses, which improved the performance on short runways, and it was just a big step up for the KC-135. Here we see an A model on the left, refueling, uh, in this case, it's a case EC-135B uh, airborne command post uh, prototype, which can both receive fuel and offload fuel, but it's equipped with the TF-33 engines, as you see here. So uh, let's see what it looks like refueling from an, a KC-135E uh, in an F-16. So we're going to pull up into what they call pre-contact. Uh, the receptacle is behind the cockpit on the F-16, so what we're going to do is pull alongside the boom and then pull up into position, and then the boomer will, uh, will slide into the center line, and the boomer will uh, drop the boom into our receptacle. But you look up, and just above the canopy bow, you can see the boomer in the window there. Uh, it's, it's quite a sight, uh, being under this uh, giant jetliner, in essence, uh, in a fighter, and uh, uh, it's done with finesse. And as I said, at any given time, there's an airplane uh, being refueled somewhere in the world. The final iteration of the KC-135 is the R model. This is fitted with uh, General Electric SNECMA CFM-56 uh, high bypass ratio turbofans, and this brings the airplane into the modern world, along with cockpit and other system upgrades. The KC-135 uh, is still uh, flying. There are approximately 360 KC-135Rs in service out of the 803 original uh, KC-135s built in 12 different models of the airplane. The fighter-to-fighter -fighter air refueling concept was tested with what uh, the Air Force called the buddy system. Here we see uh, two F-105s using that. The 105 was unique in that it contained uh, uh, two different aerial refueling capabilities, uh, hose and drogue, as you see here, and the uh, boom receptacle, which you saw earlier. Um, this was tested. It was never really put into widespread service in the Air Force. However, it was definitely uh, used by the Navy because uh, their tankers would come from the same carriers that the fighters would launch from. So here we see a North American AJ Savage refueling uh, Vought F-8 Crusaders. And uh, the mainstay of the uh, air refueling fleet, again, carrier-based, was the Douglas uh, KA-3B Sky Warrior, uh, a 1950s uh, nuclear bomber converted into the tanker role and used uh, well up into the 1980s. Here we are again with this airliner tanker uh, relationship, the McDonnell Douglas uh, DC-10. Uh, here we see a DC-10 Model 10, but the Series 30 uh, convertible freighter was converted into uh, the KC-10 Extender. Uh, this was uh, the concept of using an off-the-shelf airplane, as they said, uh, fitted with a, a new uh, digitally controlled flying uh, fly-by-wire boom system. Uh, you see it here refueling uh, in an artist concept, uh, an F-15 Strike Eagle. But the KC-10 uh, first flew in 1981, went into service uh, after certification and was uh, certified to refuel every single airplane in the uh, Air Force and most of the Navy inventory as well. It was equipped with a, a flying boom and a hose and drogue system, the first tanker to ever feature both capabilities. Here we see a different color scheme on the KC-10. Uh, this was referred to affectionately as the Shamu color scheme for the killer whale, you can see why but a good view of the uh, boomer station and the uh, refueling boom. And here's a, a view looking out. Now, by comparison, the KC-135 had the uh, boomer lying on a, a prone on his stomach. Uh, the KC-10 was almost like being in somebody's living room. It had a big picture window and three uh, airliner type seats, the boomer in the center, an instructor and observer on either side. And uh, here you see the fly-by-wire boom uh, in position on a uh, Lockheed F-117 Nighthawk. Another view of the airplane looking out over the wing, classic uh, Air Force air-to-air -air shot. But here we see the first generation of stealth, and here's the latest generation of stealth, the F-35. Uh, this is actually the X-35 Joint Strike Fighter prototype uh, demonstrator uh, undergoing what was considered uh, the first refueling of an X-plane. It wasn't, in essence, the, uh, the same as the X-planes of the 1950s, but it did have an X designation. and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, chase this mission in an F-16 as part of the Air Force Art Program. Coming into service today is the Boeing KC-46 Pegasus. This is a uh, Boeing 767-200ER airliner freighter version with a cargo door. 
179 are ordered by the Air Force. Uh, it features a Boeing 787 digital cockpit and a new system. Uh, the boomer is no longer in the tail. The boomer sits in the cockpit and uses a virtual reality closed circuit TV system uh, to pilot the fly-by-wire boom for aerial refueling. Uh, the airplane is going to be used by the United States Air Force, the Israeli Air Force, and the Japan Air Self-Defense Force. Well, if you remember uh, the uh, KC-97, uh, the 509th the Air Refueling Squadron uh, was referred to as the Flying Red Horse, and that logo uh, that you see here uh, connects to the Pegasus uh, in the uh, KC-46 that's flying today. Uh, the Flying Red Horse was uh, used for the popular mobile gas uh, slogan in the 1950s, fill her up at the Flying Red Horse. And there you have it, an overview of aerial refueling. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And thank you very much for celebrating aviation with Mike Machette. My thanks to a number of uh, units that made these photographs possible, very much appreciated. And uh, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and feel free to subscribe to the channel at the uh, 707 logo in the lower right. Uh, we'd love to have you aboard and uh, we will see you next time.